Hello everyone, it's Team Park Avenue, I'm Eric. Six Flies Magic Mountain has one of the most impressive roller coaster collections in the world. And today, I'm going to review the park as a whole. Before we get to the review, please consider subscribing to the channel. It helps out a lot, and in return you will see more rankings, reviews, and other theme park content. So to kind of run down what I'm going to be doing here, I will be going in depth my experience at this park. I went with two family members, and it was a Saturday during spring break, and I tried to get on as many things as possible in one day. So it was interesting. So through this, I'll be talking about how you can try to get on these rides in one day, minimizing wait times, and I'll also talk about the best and worst aspects of the park and go in depth on each ride. Let's begin. So first of all, Batman the Ride was closed when I went. I don't know if it's going to be down during all of the Wonder Woman construction, maybe. I didn't really know why it was closed, but I assumed it was because of that. Now let's get to the experience. The park opened at 10.30. I got to the gate around 9.00. We were getting there pretty early because we wanted to make sure we were there and we didn't have anything else we were doing that morning. So we were among the first to get in the gate. And once things opened up, pretty much right on the spot, 10.30, you know, crowds run in like a stampede. It was very, very hectic for a bit. The first ride we went to was Tatsu. Running up the mountain was definitely a bit tough. It certainly can be because it's a very steep climb you have to do to get to the back of the park. And Tatsu was our first ride of the day. I love this ride. I had went to Magic Mountain in 2017 and also 2014, but this was the most recent visit and Tatsu was just as good as I remember. Graceful at parts, also super intense at other parts, with the pretzel loop being one of the best inversions anywhere, and I love the ride a lot. The terrain adds quite a bit, it's an enjoyable long experience, and an underrated ride, and actually my second favorite ride at Six Flies Magic Mountain, and one of my favorite B&M roller coasters, period. Following Tatsu, we head to the very back of the park. There is a bit of a decline in slope once you go back here, and I will say, when you can kind of overlook Apocalypse the Ride and West Coast Racers, it looks beautiful. The mountain backdrop is not quite nice, and I just feel some parts of this park look excellent. I know the atmosphere technically isn't great here, I do think it was a very nice area, at least, in the back. West Coast Racers was the second ride of the day, and this was the only ride I had not been on at all before. And I thought it was very fun. I liked the launches, there was some good air time and hang time, the dueling aspect is pretty fun, it's long, you go through both sides, you always duel, that's cool, and I enjoyed all this on the ride. Except for the restraints. The restraints? are among the worst I've experienced. Maybe I was just the perfect height, but there's this one sharp plastic corner that really did go into my head a few times, and that hurt quite a bit. So overall, that brought down the ride. It's a good ride, but it's kind of in the middle for Magic Mountain rides because it just was not as enjoyable as it could have been. The next ride we did was Apocalypse the Ride, and I will say this one's queue is quite interesting, the outdoor parts, partially because of the crazy Los Angeles climate, really does feel like a desert wasteland thing that they're kind of going for. And then once you're inside, it's pitch dark in parts of the queue and it's hard to find your way through. But the ride itself is great. I used to think it was quite a family coaster. Now I realize it definitely is not. It does not mess around. It is intense, it has airtime. it really is quite relentless. And I guess it is technically a little bumpy, but it didn't bother me at all actually, and I thought it added to the experience overall. It felt like a true wooden coaster, and it's definitely among the best roller coasters in the park. So this was all good, and now we're gonna ride Superman Escape from Krypton. And climbing up a very high hill to get to it is one of my least favorite parts of Magic Mountain. But seriously, you have to climb pretty high and steep to get to there, and it is quite annoying. It's just the way the ride is, and I understand that, but it's definitely one of the things where the layout, because of how the park is, can be a little frustrating. The ride itself, there's forward and backward. We did both. I felt that the forward, even though the ride's launch was 100 miles per hour, felt like 60. It was not the most thrilling launch. 
the backwards was much better. Going backwards, the launch felt more powerful, and the drop just feels awesome going forward down. So I enjoyed the backward part much more, and it's a pretty solid ride overall. So going back down, we head over to Riddler's Revenge, and Riddler's Revenge, this ride I like to call Stand Up Kumba, because it has an excellent layout, but it is not smooth. I feel like Kumba is very inconsistent in how smooth it is, and while Riddler's Revenge is not as rough as Kumba, I don't think, even at its worst, it does have some bumpy moments that take away a little bit. It's definitely the best stand-up coaster, but it does have a few minor flaws there. And I will say, looking at the back area, the way they put Wonder Woman Flight of Courage in, it's getting a little cluttered back there. You have Batman the Ride, Wonder Woman Flight of Courage right in front of it, Riddler's Revenge right next to that, and the Hall of Justice really squeezed next to Riddler's Revenge. That area kind of looks nice, but it also is a little too cramped, I think. So we head over to the Scream Punk District for Twisted Colossus. And this is definitely my favorite roller coaster, at least at this point, at Six Flags Magic Mountain. The dueling aspect was not really in force when we went, but I did not think it took away from the ride. I guess the lift hill would have been more fun if we were racing alongside somebody, we could shout insults and stuff. But the ride is awesome. The first drop has no right being as powerful as it is given how short the ride is compared to, say, Iron Gwazi. The airtime is strong, the inversions are excellent, the pacing is right there with any great RMC, and it's probably one of the most underrated RMC coasters, and I think it's actually an elite ride, and very close to my top 5 coasters ever. So I love that, and I just think that's the best ride in the park. Scream was the next one we did, and I was told to give this one a second chance. I was considering not riding it, the line was somewhat long, but I did go on. And I will say, it's not great. I think it's a bit bumpier than I remembered it being. I used to think it was relatively smooth. And while there are some good inversions, the pacing on this ride is just very slow. And people complain a lot about the parking lot coaster setting. I thought that was a little weird to complain about. But when I went on, I realized because of how slow the ride is, they make sure you savor that view of the parking lot. So it is a little bit ugly to look at. It doesn't take away from the ride that much, but I will say the roughness parts and the lack of forces in the loops do. And it's among the weakest floorless coasters, I would say. So at this point, we have been on quite a few roller coasters. You know, we got on Tatsu, West Coast Racers, Apocalypse the Ride, Riddler's Revenge, Superman Escape from Crypt Hounds twice, Twisted Colossus, and Scream. This was all within the first two hours of the park being open. So my advice, if you go to this park, get there early and head toward the back first. You might think, wait for X2 first. That might be good, but if you're going to get on X2, and sometimes X2 doesn't actually open with the park, you have to wait another 15 minutes, and that's a wasted time at that point. You have to just get to the back and get on those rides where there are no lines early on. We barely beat out a half-hour line for West Coast Racers. That's what it was by the time we got off, but it was like five minutes when we got on. So keep that in mind for sure if you go. And one thing I do want to quickly point out is the operations in the park, because this first two hours went pretty quickly, but I should mention that it could have gone quicker. Tatsu did not open in time. There were a lot of test cars going, and it seemed fine, but they just decided, I don't know. I don't know if it was actually a decision, but it just was not running until about 10 minutes after opening. And I was surprised how long we waited at the final, like, loading queue area after getting off the ride, you know? Like, once the ride was over, we're just sitting in a flying position for a good three minutes. And we were the only train, so that was a little unfortunate for the people who were waiting to get on the next one. But, you know, the other operations were not bad. West Coast Racers, the big issue with that one is that you wait a pretty long time on the second train, and it's just very loud music that you're listening to the whole time. Riddler's Revenge was running pretty well, Apocalypse was running pretty well, and regarding operations, Superman actually kept its line going quite a bit, which is interesting given the kind of ride it is. I'll say Twisted Colossus, that was running a total of three cars, so they did a pretty solid job with that one, and Scream was doing pretty good, so operations here are not terrible, and they were certainly good enough that I was able to get on quite a bit early on. The next ride we're heading to is Goliath. 
two hour line, we had the full throttle instead. That one was one hour. And I will say, this is where I start to feel the heat. Magic Mountain gets extremely hot on a spring break day, not a summer day. And you can expect that in pretty much any park, but some parks do have more shade. So that was a little frustrating being at Magic Mountain, there's no shade. And then we get on full throttle and this ride is very good. That said, it could be better. I love the launch, it's pretty powerful. The loop is fantastic. The turns following are pretty good, and I think that dive into the backward launch part is pretty fun. The backward launch itself is a fun little gimmick thing they have. And the top hat is very strong. And then you get one of the most abrupt brake runs anywhere. And that part kind of hurts. And the ride is shorter than it could be, so I wish it had more to it because then it could possibly be like the number four coaster in the park. As it is, it probably sits at number six for me. But it is definitely a very fun launch coaster. Next up, we go back to Goliath. And now the line is advertising 90 minutes. We waited about 45, maybe an hour. So that wasn't too bad. And Goliath is a ride that I've mentioned before is not bad. There are some who say it's terrible, but I think it's pretty much a good, not great roller coaster in every aspect. The first drop is good, but it is not great. The airtime moments are good, there's some floater there, but it's not great airtime. The intensity is certainly good, but I feel like it doesn't quite carry through the entire ride. The sense of speed is good, but not quite hypercoaster speed. And the pacing is just not that good because of the mid-course brake run being very, very strong. But I do think it's a good roller coaster overall for sure. A bit overhated, I would say. So now we head over to the X2 area, because that and Viper are all we want to get on. Viper, we get on that, and I hear so many great things about it. I was near the middle of the car, I hear there was a mistake, and apparently it was, because the ride was not really enjoyable. Even that weird return part to the station was quite painful. It has its fun, intense moments for sure, but it's definitely among my least favorite arrow loopers. And I see why some really enjoy it, but the roughness was a bit much for me on that ride. And finally, X2. Four hour advertised line. We waited 90 minutes. And there was a sign saying they were running one train to improve operations in the future. I assume that meant they were renovating a train. But I thought it was very weird they would essentially say, please don't ride this because in the future we'll have good operations because we're running one train today. The way they said it was quite weird. The ride itself. Everyone's favorite in the park. Eh, it's not for me. It's my third favorite. It is a great ride, for sure. That lift hill is so much fun because of, you know, Enter Sandman being an awesome song and other songs being fun on that lift hill. And the vertical drop is crazy. One of the best drops out there. The crazy turns following and the inversions, very disorienting. That said, near the end of the ride, things kind of start to feel a little more normal and the craziness of the ride kind of takes a dip, and the pain of the ride definitely spikes. That final turn is very painful, even in the best seats in the ride. So that does take away from the ride a bit, and I just don't enjoy it quite as much as the graceful sensations of Tatsu, or the immaculate pacing and airtime of Twisted Colossus. So, that was every ride, and at this point, it was probably uh, five. So that meant we spent, you know, six, six and a half hours in the park, and we got on a lot of major coasters, but we had to leave for Discovery Kingdom after that. I enjoyed all these roller coasters. I didn't get to go back on New Revolution or Ninja, I'd been on those. Lex Luthor dropped the Doom's clothes, not quite sure why. But now to kind of get into a few other overall things about the park. One thing that was interesting in this park is it's the first time I ever felt like I needed to have an aspirin. And you know what? I actually did take one. There are a lot of bumpy roller coasters at this park. Cedar Point, there's like one, two, maybe three that would be like that. And I never felt like I had to have anything to soothe a headache. But at Magic Mountain, there's quite a few. I would say rides such as West Coast Racers, Riddler's Revenge, Scream, Goliath even at points. All had some parts that did make your head a little disoriented. Granted, Goliath was not because of roughness, that's more just because of the forces it exerts. 
And that's not a knock against Goliath, the other ones are ones that were quite major. And then X2 just takes the cake as one of the most painful. So that roughness aspect can make it a little less enjoyable to be at this park. And then a few general things regarding the atmosphere and operations and stuff. I think operations are okay here. I mentioned that a little earlier. And then for atmosphere and cleanliness and stuff, there wasn't a ton of trash around or anything. And water fountains were all running, which is really good. One thing I'll note is that bathrooms definitely smell like drugs. So if that bothers you, definitely don't use the bathroom here, I guess. Or just be quick about it. But that's definitely something that can bother one in the park. And now the layout. I mentioned a little earlier how hard it is to get up and down the mountain. And for what it is, it's not bad. The loop around the park is done pretty well. And I think it's pretty easy to get from ride to ride. I never really got lost except for trying to get to Superman. But it is definitely a strenuous walk from place to place in certain areas of the park. So overall, Six Flags Magic Mountain has an excellent roller coaster collection. Some strong flat rides backing it up. But with the roller coasters, when you have X2, Tatsu, Twisted Colossus, Full Throttle, Apocalypse the Ride, and Batman the Ride, which I do remember being one of my favorite Batman the Ride clones, and it's really strong being an invert when I wrote it, I just feel like its ride lineup is very hard to beat. I think the atmosphere of the park is actually a bit underrated as the setting is nice, and some areas are pretty well themed, and Magic Mountain is definitely making strides. Operations did not take away from the park too much when I went, but maybe I got a pretty lucky day, especially given how crowded it was, I'm surprised I was able to get on all the things I was. There are certain things about the park that do kind of make it feel like kind of a dump. Things like the smell in the bathrooms, and things like that. But you know what? I do think Magic Mountain is a really great park if you go for the rides, and that's what I prioritize most of the park. And that is why Magic Mountain is definitely my favorite Six Flies park so far, but I have plenty more I'm visiting soon, so we'll see if that sticks. Hello everyone, it's Theme Park Avenue, I'm Eric, and after visiting every Six Flags park except Mexico, Great America is still the one that I think is the best of them all. So here's a full review of Six Flags Great America, talking about what makes it so great, and how you can have a fantastic experience by going here. Before we begin this full review, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. In return, you will receive plenty of rankings and reviews and other theme park content, both serious and funny. For this review, I will be going into great detail about my experience, and I will be talking about how you can have a great time here, giving sort of mini reviews of everything about it, and concluding by talking about why I think this is the best Six Flies park. Let's start with the entrance experience. Driving up to the park, I was immediately drawn to the skyline. I feel this is probably the best skyline of any Six Flies park. You have beautiful roller coasters with popping colors, and such an abundance of great looking ones. I say this beats Great Adventure, Magic Mountain, and all of the others. At the actual entrance plaza, as with many other Six Flies parks, there is a line for season pass holders. A Diamond Elite member at the front of the line told every Gold member that Gold members were not allowed there. Only Diamond Elite is what he told us. We were gold members, so we left the line on the off chance he was correct. It turned out he was incorrect, so if you have a gold pass, you can go in that line. Maybe you'll encounter that same guy, and he'll tell you the same thing, but I'll just stay there if I were you. So the first ride we went to was Max Force. I was under the impression this would be the best one to go to first, and unfortunately, the ride did not open with the park. It broke down... And I actually got to hear about a rollback on it, which was interesting. I did not record that, sadly, but a rollback is interesting. And it did end up opening later, and I'll get to that. Because Max Force was closed, we went to Wizard. Wizard was also closed for a tree branch being on the track. This was a very poor start, and I was very concerned for the day I was about to have. But the first ride it went on was Viper. And Viper was definitely a good wooden coaster. I feel that this one is surprisingly long, it feels like possibly the longest wooden coaster I've been on, and that's with the American Eagle in the same park. The ride is excellent. You have fantastic airtime, a great sense of speed, and a solid layout They're not the most original from my understanding, and I just feel it's a very strong wooden coaster. 
It is pretty comparable in quality to Apocalypse the Ride at Magic Mountain. I might prefer that one a little more, but this is still a fantastic roller coaster. After that, Max Force opened. Ran back to it, probably has an hour line at this point. So, we are very upset that we left that line. That was a dumb choice on my part. But, it turns out there is a single rider line at Max Force. Which I was aware of, but I totally forgotten about once I entered the park. And here is a tip for anyone going. If you are okay with a potentially being separated from your group, or if you don't have a group at all, do the single rider lines on Max Force, Goliath, and maybe Joker. Especially on Max Force and Goliath, they can save quite a bit of time. They'll allow for re-rides, and they're pretty good. They're actually just as, if not more effective, than the Flash Pass line. So those are very helpful for sure. Just don't share this secret with everyone, okay? So, Max Force was a very strong ride. I feel that the thing that stands out about it for me is not necessarily the launch, but actually the inline twist. I think the launch outside of the front row is not all that powerful, but that one inversion is surprisingly forceful, and it's among my favorite inversions ever, I would say. The really large, quirky inversions that are before and after it are not quite as good, and I feel this ride is definitely not a standout number one in the park, in fact, I don't even have it as top 3 in the park. It's still a great ride, but it's just not quite up there like some have said. And for me personally, it would not be a top priority if I went back to the park. After this, we entered that western area where you can find Viper, and this is where Raging Bull is. By the way, props to the very solid theming in this area. They have a really nice building aesthetic that's kind of similar to El Toro's, and I think it worked well with Raging Bull. So Raging Bull on this particular day was running one train. The operations were very good, but unfortunately with how long a ride cycle this gives, one train just was not moving the line very well. So we did wait probably 20 minutes, and this is very early on of the day. So I think most days you'll probably have more trains, but the guy who was working the ride, one of them anyway, even said sorry for being Michigan's adventure today. And that is a good point to make, the staff. I feel this staff is among my favorites of any theme park I've been to. The people, some of them are roller coaster enthusiasts, others are not, but no matter what, they are going to be very efficient and very helpful. And even in line for Raging Bull, I was never that bored because both times I went on it, I made friends with the people I was going to be in the back row with, and I must say, that was a very fun experience. I sometimes get into conversations with people at the parks, in fact when I was at Great Adventure a couple days before. I was talking to a guy named Bob who had been on probably 800 roller coasters, he said. And that was cool. But I felt Great Adventure had a certain sense of community that no other Six Flags park and very few other theme parks or amusement parks have. I just enjoyed talking to people, they were all friendly, and it was just a very nice thing that kind of livened up the atmosphere of the park. So Raging Bull itself is my favorite ride in this park. I don't think it is technically an elite roller coaster. But it is very close to top 20 for me still. I just feel it's among the strongest BM hypers. Not quite up there with Mako or Goliath, but right behind those. So, the biggest weakness with this ride is that if you are going for intense forces and a great sense of speed, like the kind of thing you get on Skyrush, this is not quite that hyper. It is more like Superman the Ride at Six Lies New England a long ride experience with some good forces, excellent moments and a wonderful experience that makes for an overall fantastic roller coaster. Now, I do prefer Superman the Ride, because I do feel it has stronger airtime, and airtime is something I love. But with Raging Bull being such a long, fun, adventurous experience, I had almost as fun as that, even though there are really only two or three moments that give very strong airtime. So even though the ride is not the thing I like most in the ride, it is the thing I like second most, and that is length. I enjoy a long ride if it gives a lot of great moments. And this one really proves that roller coasters are all about fun, and it's the roller coaster I had the most fun with at Six Flags Great America. So the next ride we went to was Justice League Battle for Metropolis. I was with my younger brother, so we had to do that at some point. It was fine. My gun was a bit busted, but it's fine. Those rides are fun, but not anything too spectacular as far as shooting rides go. But the next major ride we went to was X-Flight, and X-Flight is definitely among my favorite roller coasters in the park. 
I think B&M wing coasters are underrated as a whole, and this one is near perfect. I feel that it is incredibly forceful, and every inversion is top notch, especially the inline twist through the near miss elements. Not just for those elements, but because of how much hang time you get. This ride is graceful and powerful, and very reminiscent of what makes Tatsu an elite roller coaster. Now, I will say, there is one flaw, and that is especially on the outside seats near the back, you might get a bit of bumpiness in that final helix. And that's the only part of the ride I don't think is fantastic. But when the rest of it is, this is definitely a top tier roller coaster. I do still prefer Gatekeeper, and I don't think this is technically a perfect ride, but it's one I just enjoyed a lot, and it's definitely a top three for me in the park. So following this, we go over to American Eagle, and this is a hard ride to get to because it's a good 5-10 to 10 minute walk to get from the entrance sign to the loading station. Fortunately, I guess that deters a few people because no one ever rides this thing. And when I went, I'm not sure this will be a permanent thing, it is not racing. So we were just on the blue side, and that's all we did. But this is still a phenomenal roller coaster. I love the airtime moments early on. It has a phenomenal sense of speed, especially for a wooden coaster. And most of the ride is stellar. The only thing I did not like about the ride was the helix. I felt like it was a bit janky and just didn't do a whole lot for me personally. But this is a long, fun ride experience that I put right around where Viper is, maybe a little better. And following this, we went to the ride I was most excited for that day, Goliath. Single ride line came in handy, and this is an anomaly of a wooden roller coaster for me, because, as far as RMCs go, it has some of the best moments of any RMC roller coaster. The dive loop and stall are some of the best inversions, and outside of the death roll on Iron Gwazi, I would say the best inversions of any RMC. The first drop, as usual on RMC, is phenomenal, and you have some fantastic stuff in between those moments. There's even one really good airtime hill. Unfortunately, I have named pretty much every element of the ride, so this one does have the shortcoming of being short. It just doesn't have as much to it as some of the other RMCs, and I feel that means it's not quite as good because I enjoy a mix of quantity and quality. And this one has the quality, but not as much the quantity. Now, the other thing is that this ride can actually be pretty rough. When I was in the back row, I found at the bottom of the first hill especially, it was really janky. But this is a top tier roller coaster, and it's just behind Raging Bull for me because I had so much fun with Raging Bull. So Goliath is great, and we head over toward that DC area. And here you get a beautiful view of pretty much the entire park. And that's something I want to point out. From nearly anywhere in this park, you can see at least three or four major roller coasters. And because of how beautiful all of them look, I love that. This one particular area gives views of X-Flight, American Eagle, Raging Bull, Max Force, and Viper. And even Batman the Ride because you're right next to that. And with how stunning all of these look, that's a standout thing here. Because of how pretty they make all these roller coasters and how well kept this park is, compared to every other Six Flags park pretty much especially, the park looks so clean and well done, and when you have the appearances of Goliath, Raging Bull, X-Flight, American Eagle, every steel and wooden roller coaster here has great colors and a great appearance, and it stands out amongst other Six Flags parks. There are others with very good looking rides, I think the King to Kyle Toro area is a standout in Six Flags, but overall, the roller coaster lineup just looks beautiful at Great America, so walking around I was taken in all the sights, and had just as much fun as when I was not riding anything. So the next ride we went on was Flash Vertical Velocity, and after Wicked Twister closed, rest in peace, I was very happy to ride this. I do prefer Wicked Twister a bit, as this one bumped my ear pretty hard at one point, and I do prefer going spiraling backwards rather than straight. That said, this is still a great roller coaster, with strong launches and fun forwards and backwards moments. I do wish a holding brake was still working as that would add so much to it and make it arguably the best of impulse coasters, but it is still a great underrated ride. And next we go over to Batman the Ride. The original Batman is like a piece of history. The first inverted coaster, that meant a lot. At this point, I had probably been on nearly every Batman the Ride clone. There were 
three, I think, in the world I had not been on. But this is still one of the best. It stands out for its terrain usage. It is also probably the smoothest of them all, as crazy as that sounds given that's the oldest. But I had so much fun with it. They keep the paint job really nice in this one. Going through the terrain, going so close to hitting things to your feet, added a lot to each element. And I find Batman the Riot clones underrated as a whole. And the fact that they're clones does not detract from how good they are. So I love these rides. And this is one of the best Batman the Riot clones out there. Joker was the next ride we did. And this is definitely a free spin. It is not a great free spin. It is not a terrible free spin. It is a good free spin like any of them would be. My ride was not a standout one, but I do still enjoy these rides. At their best, they are actually really strong rides that could compete with something like V2. But as it stands, I would put this one below V2 overall. Next up, we went to Superman Ultimate Flight. And the biggest issue with the appearance of this park is the fact that Superman Ultimate Flight and the Dark Knight Coaster are in the Mardi Gras section. I kind of get why, because they didn't want a huge DC area, but I still kind of wish they did that. So Superman. This is an underrated flying coaster. I am kind of a sucker for the B&M Flyer model, and I find all the Superman rides good. This one is just as intense and gives a great flying sensation like the others. And I feel that even though it does not use the terrain the same way over George's does, I have a lot of fun with this great mix of intense and graceful moments. The standout moment on this ride, though, was after the pretzel loop, because I watched a phone fall all the way to the ground and shatter into five massive pieces, and probably many other tiny microscopic ones. That was an unforgettable experience on a ride, and on that note, the loose article policy here is good. They have places to put your stuff on plenty of the rides, pretty much all of them and they kind of separate bins the way Cedar Point does, so they handle loose articles really well. If you take your phone on the ride with you, with nothing keeping it secure, yeah, that might not end well, but for everyone else, it's a great system. So the next ride we did was the Dark Knight Coaster, and this one, when I heard the truck honking when I was in the queue, I got so excited to ride this. For those who do not know, this has a clone at Six Flags Great Adventure, and one of my favorite parts of this ride is the terrifying truck that just pops out of nowhere near the end. And they don't do that anymore. I'm assuming there were too many complaints at Great Adventure, but at Great America, they do it. Every effect was working on this one, which is very different from Great Adventure. It was a bit jankier though. I still enjoy this Wild Mouse, I consider the Dark Knight coaster one of the best Wild Mouse coasters out there, but this one is slightly better overall than the Great Adventure one for the good theming elements that are working. So at this point, we are at the front of the park again, and we decide to ride the carousel. And while it looks beautiful at the front of the park, this is the worst carousel by far. It is the slowest, the horse designs are nothing special, and the ride is weirdly bumpy? I didn't think I'd ever say that for a carousel, but that was the case. So, only if you have young kids should you ride this. Out to the young kid, my brother, but even he didn't like it that much. But we went on Wizard afterwards. And this is a very fun, unique family coaster. The seating arrangement is so much fun, and I think there are some pretty fast, intense moments in this one. It's very quirky and honestly quite reminiscent of Arrow Mine Trains in its use of terrain, along with the fact that there are multiple lift hills. I don't think this is as good as some Arrow Mine Trains, but it is better than quite a few. And it is definitely my favorite family coaster in the park. And Demon was the next ride we went to, and this was the final major roller coaster. Demon was not great. I do like the appearance of it. The way they do the rock work, and that skeleton tunnel, and some of the glowing tunnels, it's all really fun. But the ride itself, has some of my least favorite corkscrews of any roller coaster. But like pretty much every other arrow looper, the vertical loops are certainly passable, and there is some enjoyability to the ride. And it's decent, but it's not something I really want to go on again. The other ride we went on was their drop tower, 
I apologize for not knowing the name of the drop tower off the top of my head, and I probably should because it is one of my favorites. If you sit facing the rest of the park, you will be rewarded with one of the best views from any drop tower I've ever done. You see pretty much every roller coaster, and it is quite beautiful because, as I mentioned earlier, this park's appearance is pretty much impossible to beat. And the drop itself gives crazy airtime and is far more stomach dropping than even other Intamin drop towers have done. So that was good. The following things we did were Sprocket Rockets and Little Dipper. These are essentially the kiddie coasters of the park, but they are larger than the average kiddie coaster. The main reason I rode those was not only because I had a younger brother who wanted to do them, but also because I knew I would be ranking every roller coaster created in America, and I knew I wanted to have been on everything to properly rank them. Now the thing with these two is, they are larger than your average family coaster. As far as kiddie coasters go, they do feel like pretty decent sizes. Little Dipper is a fun wooden coaster, but you're never going to believe this. It is my least favorite of the wooden coasters in the park. But nah, it's still fun. And they are good rides for families and kids for sure. So after officially riding every roller coaster in the park, we did re-rides on X-Flight, Raging Bull, Goliath, and Max Force. This was overall a very fun day at the park. Being able to get on every roller coaster was great, though I do feel the park was not as crowded as usual, so if you go on a crowded day, here is my advice. If you use single rider lines, you should go to Superman Ultimate Flight first, as that had consistently the longest line besides Max Force and Goliath. 45 minutes to an hour pretty much the whole day. So if you get on that early, you will not have to worry later on. Then I would go clockwise around, hitting things in the DC area, and because Raging Bull and X-Flight had really strong operations, and I feel X-Flight was pretty much always 10 minutes or less, those are less of a priority. Also using the single rider lines on Goliath and Max Force is important. If you do not want to use single rider lines, you should hit Max Force and then go in that same clockwise order. So regarding the park operations, I do want to go a little more into that. So I mentioned that dispatches were good, but they were just incredibly strong. I think the Batman the Ride team was unbelievably fast. Like, I'm not sure those people were human because of how fast they were getting trains out. They were running a lot of trains on most things, even with Raging Bull not all that good because there's only one train. The dispatches were pretty much always 30 seconds. So clearly the people here care, has a good sense of community with those people, and they clearly want to make sure everyone has a great time, not waiting in lines as much as enjoying the rides. Another good thing about this park I didn't point out yet was the layout. This is easily the best layout of any Six Flags park. It is a loop, but it is not huge and easily manageable, and finding your way from ride to ride is incredibly easy. The only things I could possibly see you being somewhat frustrated with are how the kitty area is a little bit kind of cut off from the rest of the park, and the fact that you don't go exactly on the loop to get to Raging Bull, but rather you have to kind of walk into a different western area. But honestly, that wasn't a huge deal for me. So overall, I love Six Flags Great America. Maybe it was just the day I had and it was super lucky, but I had so much fun here, and this is my favorite Six Flags park. I feel that its quantity of great rides easily beats Great Adventure, Magic Mountain, and thus every other Six Flags park I've been to. When you have Raging Bull, X-Flight, Max Force, Goliath, Batman the Ride, Superman Ultimate Flight, Vertical Velocity, Viper, American Eagle. It is a pretty hard lineup to beat. So many great ones. So even if the top four here were closed, I feel you could still have a great time here riding roller coasters. Whereas a park such as Magic Mountain, without the top four, you're not left with quite as much. The same could even be said for Cedar Point. I would say the supporting lineup is pretty comparable to that in quality. I feel they don't have a ton of flat rides here, and they don't have a standout elite roller coaster like plenty of other Six Flies parks, a lot of lesser ones in fact. But I don't mind too much because they have so many great rides here that even without a bunch of flat rides, you'll still have a great time riding roller coasters here. And the other important thing to note is that I feel this is the best kept of the Six Flies parks. The only other contender is Fiesta Texas for its great hues, 
but this park just has great paint jobs on everything. It's so clean. Every staff member cares. And people working at the park and running the park, kudos to you. You're doing a fantastic job. And it's so great to hear how many people have this as their home park and enjoy going here, as I feel pretty much over any other park I've ever been to. I would say over every Six Flags park and over most Cedar Fair parks. I would go back to Great America before any of them. It's that good. Hello everyone, it's Steampark Avenue, I'm Eric. I just went to Six Flags La Ronde in Montreal, Canada. And I must say, even though some, such as Coaster Studios, have said it is among the worst theme parks in the world, I had a great time here. And today I will tell you about my experience and how you can have a similar great time by going to this park. Before we get into the review, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel so you know when new theme park content comes out. I'll make other reviews, rankings, and plenty of other content, some funny, some serious, but let's get to the review. So I will talk about my experience in depth, my first day at La Ronde, it was a very nice day, and I'll talk about some of the certain aspects of the park, and how you can have a great time here, and along the way I will definitely be calling out Coaster Studios, because a few of his complaints in his review even though it was four years ago and I'll give him benefit of the doubt, were a little weird. So starting with the entry experience, I love driving up to this park. You have to go along a bridge that's pretty high up, and you are above all the rides and you get a beautiful view. The park has a fantastic setting. You are in the St. Lawrence River on St. Helens Island, with the Montreal skyline on one side of you, and there's a beautiful lake in the center of the park, and it just looks really nice. A lot of the rides, even though most of the paint jobs are not all that good, they look nice surrounding the lake and it's just very well done. And I love the way it looks. Now for the parking experience. This was arguably the worst part of the day because there's a huge do not enter sign at the parking lot for La Ronde. So we were kind of going around looking for the actual parking area after seeing that sign. Then we realized about five, 10 minutes after that that's where we were supposed to go. Then for the actual entrance, there's a very weird way to do the switchbacks. They have a bunch of gates set up essentially, and it's not the most orderly, but honestly, so many people get to the park early that I guess they have to have that kind of thing in place. But seriously, it, it was a very long line to get in. Now I gotta point out, Canopy Coaster said it took him two hours to get into the park. I'm not sure if he went in around entry, but I thought the line moved very fast. Perhaps recently, the park has upped its game in this regard. And in terms of operations, they clearly have, and I'll get to that later. So we enter the park as a clear, very hot day, and we decide to head over toward Vampire, which is the Batman, the Ride clone, and other things on the left side of the park first. And the first pro tip for this park, definitely go to that left area first. With rides such as the B&M Invert, Vampire, Titan, the Giant Zamperla Frisbee ride, Orbite, I think that's how you pronounce that which is the drop tower, and they have a sky screamer over there. Very few people go to this area first, so you will have practically no line on most of these rides. As a matter of fact, my brother and I got on all of those rides in that area that we did not ride the sky screamer in the first half hour of the park being open. So that was fantastic. So that was a good start, and I'll talk about each ride. The first ride we did was Vampire. This Batman the Ride clone does not have the Batman theming due to the fact that the DC characters are not licensed in La Ronde and they do not have that. That said, it's very interesting that they do have pretty much the same kind of cue that they would for a Batman the Ride clone. They don't have the huge oven warehouse that you have to sit in, but it looks very Gotham City-like. And I guess that kind of fits with the vampire theme to an extent, but it was interesting. We saw a beaver in the queue. And I will say, if you enjoy wildlife, there's actually quite a bit in this park. We saw a beaver run across a path. There was some giant fish that was living in the pond in the lake area. And there were plenty of birds, some red-winged blackbirds and seagulls all around. But the coolest were the beaver and the giant fish. So regarding wildlife and nature, that's kind of an interesting thing to point out. Vampire is a good ride. It is a Batman the Ride clone. I like these. I think there was a bit of headbanging on the corkscrew. 
and it is a solid ride. The one thing I'll say is that compared to the other Batman inverts, it's among the weaker ones. I'd say it's better than Over Texas, but I prefer the other ones. That said, it's still a very strong ride. Next, we rode Titan, which is the giant Zamperla Frisbee. And this one is so, so much fun. Many of them are fun. I enjoy the crazy floater airtime and speed that you feel when you ride this kind of thing. But the best part of it is that for part of this ride, you go over the water. So it is very likely you will be face to face with the water at certain points. And that is quite thrilling and fun. And that was definitely a highlight of that ride for me. And I would say because of that, it's probably my favorite of that type of ride. Better than Harley Quinn's Insanity, and even better than a different but similar ride, Max Air at Cedar Point. So that's a good start. Next we rode the Drop Tower. It's an S&S &S one, and it's pretty fun. I liked being able to see parts of the park, very beautiful views from the top, but it's not the most thrilling of Drop Towers, though it is a solid ride. Next we headed over to Boomerang or Lay Boomerang, and it was good. No, it wasn't, but the line was actually pretty solid. They were moving pretty well, and I'll get to that a little later, the lines, because actually the lines moved pretty well the whole day. It took us about 10 minutes to get on, and this Boomerang is among the weakest. It has some pretty rough transitions. It's similar to the others. I like some Boomerangs, such as the Flying Cobras at Carowinds. This one was bad. And then I saw... Le Monster testing. This is a massive wooden roller coaster. It's dueling, sort of. It's racing tracks, but they rarely duel the cars, from my understanding. And I'm not sure why I was under the impression this was closed all season, but it was not. So we rode the Larson Superloop Chaos because they hadn't started running people on the ride yet. Then after we got out of the Superloop, we saw that people were on Le Monster. So our party goes over and gets on it. I heard this ride was rough and terrible, and most of my family agreed. I did not. I thought after the first drop, there was some really terribly janky stuff for a little bit, but most of the ride, while kind of slow, was actually quite smooth, and it was mildly enjoyable. So I did actually have a pretty fun time on this ride, and I honestly think because of the imposing figure this ride is in the skyline, I think it's probably the most visually impressive ride in the park. I don't want this RMC. I would love to see a different change, and I'll get to that change a little later. So at this point, it has been only, I'd say, 90 minutes in the park, and we have gotten on quite a bit. The next ride we head to is Demon, a really crazy flat ride that was honestly quite scary. I will say your arms, you cannot move them, at least not your forearms, during this ride, and that's a little scary and frustrating, but the ride is quite cool. Your head comes pretty close to the ground, and it's quite frightening at certain points. It's a really fun ride to watch from being off of it, and very disorienting while on the ride. So I enjoyed that, and the line moved pretty well on that one. So after this, we got some food. This was poutine. And Taylor, I must say, if you got the same size poutine as we did, it is dinner. My family of six, shared a total of two portions and we were all satisfied and there was only one size offered where we were it was reasonably priced for what it was and i don't see how he could have gotten a small portion unless a lot has changed in four years in portion sizes i guess that's possible that said i understand where you thought poutine didn't seem like a dinner on the item because it was french fries but it is so good and i was very happy with the food in this area so after this we head to goliath the star attraction of the park, and I would call this my favorite. It is essentially a smaller B&M Hyper, and I think it's great. Its layout is essentially airtime hills, but they all provide excellent floater. I recommend riding in the back row on this one because you really get pulled over each hill, and the drop is much better in the back. That said, the front rows, they do offer better floater airtime, but you do get pulled out of your seat in a bit more ejector style if you ride near the back. And Goliath had the best operations of the day. They were running two trains and they had huge lines of people and we were through 15 minutes every time. One other important note about Goliath, the ride operators here, especially if you're an enthusiast and you don't like stapling, keep this in mind, they do staple you. I know it might seem like I'm complaining, but 
you can still have a great ride on this even if you do get stapled, but I am pointing out the employees will put both hands on the top and push down as hard as they can, no matter who you are. So keep that in mind. Maybe if you want to prepare for that, and if you get really uncomfortable on this sort of ride, definitely be aware of that. Stapling is a thing on Goliath. I see it on very few roller coasters, but it's a thing here, and it doesn't really take away from the ride experience, but just in case you wanted to know that. And now it is time to ride Edinor Latag, the Vekoma SLC. This is officially the worst roller coaster I've ever ridden. It had me saying Flight Deck of Canada's Wonderland is not that bad. It really was that terrible. It hurts every part of your body. And I have to wonder, why does this ride even exist? I assume it's because it's somewhat compact, but they put the Vampire invert before this. So why would you need a second invert, much less an inferior one? That said, the ride does have a very nice location as it's kind of over the water, and that's pretty cool. And I do like the way they did the queue, even though it's a little interesting how long a walk you have to take to get to the entrance and exit and such. That said, I would like to see this ride taken down before I saw Monster taken down. And they've already gotten rid of a few rides at this park, such as Super Menage and Cobra. So I could see this going pretty soon, and I would be pretty happy with that. So following this, we rode Dragon. Dragon is a family coaster indoors. It's pretty fun. It doesn't pull crazy forces, but it doesn't need to. There's some solid theming, but it's mostly just statues and some glowing stuff. I was expecting a few steam effects, which could have been pretty cool because of the dragon thing, but it didn't really go all out with that. It's somewhat short, but it is a fun ride. We actually went back to Laron for a few hours the following day, and it was fun. It was pretty quiet, so we got to Marathon Goliath. We went on four times in a row without having to get out. And there were two other rides we went on that I do want to touch on. The first is Vol Ultime, which is the skyscraper in the park. This one, as opposed to the tall ones that goes up and stays up for a while, this one goes up, down, up, down, up, down. You get a great view of La Ronde, as you would expect, because the park is beautiful. You have that great surrounding area. I enjoyed that, and it is a fun ride overall. Then you have Toboggan Nordique, which is the Zamperla Wild Mouse, as opposed to the Mock Wild Mouse coasters I'm used to. This one's cars are a bit more cramped, which is actually good because when you're slammed side to side as you are on any wild mouse, it's a little less rough. You don't get as much space to kind of get slammed, so it's pretty fun. I like the cute little theme they had because the cars were themed to different countries. We were in the Jamaica car, so it was like cool runnings. The finale of this ride is really well paced. It wasn't too painful, so it is a solid wild mouse overall. And that concludes all of the rides you went on at La Ronde. Now to talk about a few important things. Operations are the first thing I want to talk about. I kid you not, this might have the best operations of any Six Flags park the day I went. I went on a slightly more crowded than average day. It was a Saturday, plenty wanted to go, and the lines were handled so well. I've never seen a Vokoma SLC run two trains, but Ednor did. Goliath ran two trains, Vampire ran two trains, Monster was running both tracks, one train on each. And the Boomerang was running two trains. Nah, no, just kidding about that last one. But most of the rides that could were running two trains. And that kept things moving really well in lines. I don't think I waited more than 20 minutes in a single line. And some of those lines were huge. If you see my Great Escape review, I would say the amount of people in line for an hour line there was comparable to some of the 20 minute lines here. So that was shocking. And I will say the staff is great. I don't know if Coaster Studios mentioned the staff being bad in his LaRon review, but the staff here was fantastic. Regarding the French-English language barrier, you don't need to know a lot of French to get around here. You can get around with some pretty simple terminology, but a lot of the workers speak English and that works well. They were all friendly and helpful. Thanks to them, I was able to be aware of the whole Les Monster opening and that was really great. So I was quite happy with the staff. And now I guess I should talk about the clientele and the people visiting the park, who Kozo Studios in this review did claim were horrible. I would disagree. I didn't have many interactions with people. They were nice. There was some line jumping, but that's to be expected at basically any park, and I'm pretty numb to line jumping, honestly, so it didn't bother me much. Nobody was playing in the urinals either, so I guess I'll point that out. Another thing I briefly wanted to touch on was the loose article policy here. Compared to Six Flags Great Adventure, which has a terrible policy by the way, this one is great. At Great Adventure, 
you can't have any loose articles on brides unless you're really sneaky. For La Ronde, they allow you to bring stuff. They trust that you won't lose it, and most of the people there are willing to follow that. I don't think there was any issue with someone losing an article, and they had zipper pockets if necessary and button pockets, so no one was losing things. Many of the rides you don't even have to worry about losing anyway, but it really helps the lines moving, and they have cubbies on the sides of many of the rides, so they're doing a great job, and I hope every Six Flags park adopts a similar system to them. Another good thing about this park is the amount of Coke Freestyle machines. They are easy to use, they are everywhere. In fact, there was a huge sort of warehouse that has Coke Freestyle logos all over it, and it's dedicated entirely to that. So that's very helpful. And I should mention lines for food here are some of the shortest at any Six Flags park I've seen. Maybe we just got really lucky with how they were moving the lines, but it was never more than 20 minutes anywhere for any food item. And I hear and I've seen that an hour is a much more common sight at a Six Flags park. One thing I could mention about this park quickly regarding the atmosphere and appearance is that there is a monorail running through the whole thing. It's called the mini rail and it's probably the biggest eyesore in the park. It's very rusty and looks as if it has not run in a while. And the cars are just chip advertisements, which is a little weird and jarring because there aren't as many advertisers in the park in my opinion. So that is definitely a weaker part of the atmosphere. That said, the rest of the park looks great. So, overall, La Ronde is an underrated park. Regarding Six Flags parks, so far it still is probably second to last above Great Escape and below the others, but that's just because this ride lineup isn't quite up there with others. But there really wasn't anything I disliked about this park. I thought the layout was pretty solid because the park is not huge, but it's pretty easy to get around. The ride lineup is good. I think Goliath is a great top ride to have. And the supporting Vampyr and some of the other roller coasters are decent. That said, I would say the third best roller coaster here, as tough as it is to say, is probably Monster. But the flat rides do add quite a bit because I really enjoyed rides such as Titan and Demon. The park is very beautiful. Next to Discovery Kingdom, it might be the best looking Six Flags park because of the lake and some of the areas are nicely themed. The park is in a beautiful location and that adds a lot to it. The food was good. The operations were shockingly spectacular. And honestly, I must give kudos to La Ronde. This park is run way better than I was expecting. And maybe I should have gone in with a better mindset. Obviously, many hate La Ronde solely because of some reviews that are on the internet. And I totally get it. There are plenty of reviews on the internet that hate this ride that are not just Coaster Studios. But I would say, definitely visit this place if you get the chance. Give it the opportunity it deserves, and you will see, if you have the kind of day I did at least, that La Ronde is a very well-run park. But remember, the tip is to go to the area with Vampire and Similar over to the left first, because Goliath's line runs the fastest, so you don't really have to rush over there. And then I guess rides such as Monster are a bit slower, so you might want to get on those earlier if the ride is running. And that is just some of my advice. Thank you for watching this review. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment your thoughts on Laron down below. And I'm sorry I called that Coaster Studios a few many times, but honestly, I think when most people think of Laron, they probably think of his review. So I did want to address some of the points he made. Hello everyone, it's Theme Park Avenue. I'm Eric. Six Flags Over Georgia is probably one of the most acclaimed Six Flags parks. So today, I'll be talking about my most recent visit there, discussing the best things about it, the worst things about it, and what the park should improve in the future. Before we begin this review, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel so you know when new reviews and other theme park content such as rankings and comedy videos come out. So I should quickly explain, I'll be doing a sort of recap of my visit, going through all different events that happened, and every once in a while I will stop to elaborate on certain aspects of the park, such as the atmosphere and operations. Let's begin. So from the entrance experience, by the way, this took place December 26th, 2021. It was not a super crowded day, I think it was kind of in the middle. There's a decent amount of people, but not like hour line everywhere slammed kind of day. So we got there, I'd say a half hour before the gate opened. And I did like watching Goliath test from being outside the gate because it looks beautiful. And it's such an imposing figure on the skyline. So we went to the entrance plaza. 
And that is a very nice looking area. We were let in probably 10, 15 minutes before Rogue Drop was set on the website, so that was cool. We went over to Twisted Cyclone right away because that was the only roller coaster we had not ridden before. And by the way, Twisted Cyclone is right at the entrance, so if you want to knock that one out first, it's very close by, very convenient, and I definitely like that. The ride itself, we got there 10 minutes before the ride was supposed to open. The ride opened 15 minutes after it was supposed to open due to a staffing issue. And this is interesting. So I suppose they have to have three people on the loading deck minimum to run the ride. And there were two, so we had to wait for somebody to come over from Batman the Ride. I overheard them saying it was from Batman the Ride, and I felt bad for that person because the walk from Batman to the Ride is actually pretty long. You have to climb up a hill, so I felt bad for that person. But they ended up getting there, and we were all very happy, and we got on the ride. Got a couple rides on it, and Twisted Cyclone, honestly, it is a great ride. But compared to the other RMCs, it is definitely the weakest link. And I have ridden New Texas Giants and Joker. I think those are much better. This one has some good elements. There's some strong airtime. And some of the inversions are actually among the best on RMCs. But there are weaknesses. The pacing, for example, is definitely weaker than all the other RMCs I've done. And that does include Jersey Devil. I'd also say it's a bit shorter than the other RMCs, and that does kind of take away... And it does definitely feel much shorter than other RMCs, unlike Iron Gwalzi, which actually felt really long despite not being nearly the length of Steel Vengeance. And then you also have the fact that its stats are less impressive, and stats can make a difference in how fast the ride feels. So the ride does have a few shortcomings compared to other RMCs, but on its own, it's a great top 30 roller coaster, and definitely one of the best rides in the park. But back to that one operation thing, there were two trains running on Twisted Cyclone, and that was probably one of very few rides that was running too. Daredevil Dive had three trains going, but the rest of them all had one. And I will say, for the kind of day it was, I feel like that probably wasn't normally a big deal. But if they were running two trains on things like Batman the Ride and Superman Ultimate Flight, I think they could have actually cut the times by like a half hour each from those rides later in the day. And that would be really helpful for the guest experience. I'll elaborate a bit more on that later. The next ride we did was Georgia Scorcher. And this stand-up coaster I used to think was among the worst roller coasters ever. Now I think it is a solid ride. It has its bumpy moments, and its layout is not the most interesting. But it's pretty intense, and it does have fun moments for sure. And I enjoy the ride overall. I'll also say the new colors are pretty good. So next we go over to Goliath, and Goliath is definitely the best ride in the park. No question. I thought it was going to be pretty close between Twisted Cyclone and Goliath when I went to the park, but nah, Goliath definitely stands above it. Quite literally as well, because that first drop is phenomenal. Then you have strong floater airtime, a very intense helix, and excellent ejector airtime following that. A simple but effective layout that makes one of the best B&M hypers and one of the best B&M roller coasters out there. Definitely an excellent roller coaster, my favorite at the park. And it's one of the things, honestly, that made the operation seem really good. They were running one train on Goliath, but the line never got over 20 minutes for pretty much the whole day. I'm not quite sure how they were doing that. Maybe not a lot of people were getting in line for it, but it was just very surprising to me. We head over to Daredevil Dive next, and Daredevil Dive, I thought, on my first visit in 2017, was an awesome underrated roller coaster and one of the best at the park, and it still is. It's not quite as good as I remember though. I think it's very intense and all the elements hit quite well, and the little bits of theming actually add a bit to the ride. The one thing is, I understand it's for capacity reasons, but that mid-course break run does slow down the second half of the ride somewhat substantially. So it's not a knock against the ride, but if that wasn't in force, the ride would be better. Not that it's bad, because it's still an underrated and awesome Gearslaw ride. So, we have done this, and now we're headed to the Gotham City area. And now to talk about the layout. For this particular area, you walk down a very steep incline to get to Riddler Mindbender and Batman the Ride, along with Joker Chaos Coaster if you want, I guess. 
And the layout here, honestly, here's where I'll get a little mean. It's the worst layout I've ever had in a theme park. I haven't done a ton of theme parks that people complain about layouts for, such as La Ronde, as of the recording. But this one is just very tough to get around. The elevation change is definitely a pretty tough part of that weird dead end that you have for Gotham City. But I also found it was very tough to get around. I actually spent most of my day at the park with Dog Coasters, who is a local to Six Flies Over Georgia area. And even he, at points, wasn't certain which way to go. And it's not a knock against him, but the park is just very confusing. I definitely got lost a couple times, and getting to the back is just quite a weird, challenging walk to do in the most efficient manner. So the layout, it's tough to get around, and that can be a frustrating thing at a theme park. When you don't know where you are and you're getting lost, that can definitely be something that just makes the experience a little less fun for that day. So the Gotham area, Riddler Mindbender. I wrote it as Mindbender first, and I thought it was the best Schwarzkopf coaster. What did they do to this thing? It is definitely, definitely not the best anymore. It is a good ride. I enjoy the first drop and the inversions, but there's some very jarring moments where it feels like some roughness comes out of nowhere, and the pacing has gotten much, much worse, where it seems like it just completely slows down before each drop afterwards. I, can, I think I'd best describe it as Val Raven's mid-course break run is what it feels like each time you go down another drop. So I think that ride, while good, is probably, instead of being above Shockwave and Montezuma's Revenge, is now in a similar league to Scorpion at Busch Gardens Tampa. Batman the Ride was the next one. And so many tell me this is the best Batman the Ride clone. So intense, better than all the others. And while I don't think it's by a huge margin, I think they're right. It is an underrated ride for sure. A lot of people, well, some people, knock the ride for being a clone. I must disagree with this because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this is a great ride to have at multiple parks. And they all provide different sensations, this one being very intense. Possibly the best pacing of any Batman the Ride clone. And I just think even though it's not as good as inverts such as Montu or Raptor, it is an excellent ride. And all B&M inverts are good, and this is definitely a great roller coaster to have at the park. So, climbing that incline to get out of the Gotham City area, we go over to Monster Mansion. Monster Mansion, I had not ridden on my first visit, and this dark ride is among my favorites. The line was moving quite slowly because they were putting four people in each eight to nine person boat. But this ride, I have a full review of it about why I love it so much. So I'll kind of keep this one brief. But you have the fun, surreal partying elements with tons of monster animatronics and lights and music and all that. Then you get to the marsh. And you both through complete silence and darkness. Until every once in a while, lights come on and you'll see a dragon or some other scary monster. The atmosphere is nailed at this part of the ride. And it's pretty immersive actually. The only thing I guess you could say the ride isn't perfect with is that the ceiling is not themed so it's very obvious lights above you, but that's not an issue in the marsh because of how well it did that part. And the fun song at the end is catchy, I love Monster Mansion, and I think you absolutely must ride it when you go to the park because it's pretty much at the level of Batman the Ride in quality for me. It's that good. So. We have now ridden quite a few roller coasters and monster mansions, so the one other I want to get on is Superman Ultimate Flight. And this flying coaster, it was running very slowly, and the loose article policy was very weird on this ride, and something I definitely have to mention. They have cubbies next to the ride, and presumably for COVID reasons, you are not allowed to use those anymore. I don't know if that has been lifted since the end of 2021, but that meant you had to have the ride you know, your pockets had to have all your stuff in them. And if there's any ride where you're going to lose stuff in your pockets, it's a flying coaster. I have zipper pockets, so it was not an issue for me, but it's something I think many have probably struggled with before. Many have probably lost items because they've been required to take them on. Now for the ride itself. This was the original Superman Ultimate Flight. It was made for this plot of land. And you can tell, it is fantastic. There are some sort of near-miss elements, like tunnels, and how close you get to the ground at certain points. 
And honestly, I think this ride is more underrated even than Daredevil Dive and Batman the Ride. It is fantastic. You have the Pretzel Loop, which is among the best inversions in the world. Graceful elements and turns, a strong twist as a second inversion. I think one less turn and one more inversion with a bit more intensity to it would go a long way for the ride. But I love the balance of smooth graceful moments and crazy parts that try to rip your head off. I think flying coasters as a whole are kind of underrated and I'm a sucker for that model honestly. And even though this is not as good as Tatsu or Manta per se, it's a great ride. And actually my third favorite at Six Flies Over Georgia. So after this, just for fun, we decided to ride Justice League Battle for Metropolis. And I haven't talked about this ride much before on the channel, but I'll do it quickly here. It is a fun ride. The pre-show is pretty good. There's a few parts that are a bit weird. But when the lion is moving really slowly and you're there for 45 minutes, the pre-show does get a little annoying. The ride itself has some really strong practical effects. The guns work well. It is fun. And I guess some of the screens were a bit weird at times and the transitions between them were not great. But it is fun and it's pretty well done for what it is. Definitely a good ride to have in multiple parks and I think it's a pretty solid dark ride overall. And that was it for this whole trip. I'll kind of elaborate on the atmosphere quickly because I haven't talked about that yet. This park does look nice in certain areas. I think the back actually looks beautiful because Superman Ultimate Flight is such a beauty to watch. And then you have the Hall of Justice right next to that, and that is just a very nice photo area. Great American Scream Machine also is a really nice plot because you have a huge amount of land back there. And you can see all the way back there, and that's something that's kind of special. And I'd say the same for the Blue Hawk thing. And on that note of Blue Hawk and Great American Scream Machine, those were closed, but I've written them before. And I mentioned in my ranking of the roller coasters, Blue Hawk is a good ride, but not a great one. And Great American Scream Machine is among my least favorite roller coasters out there. Though I do understand why some might enjoy it. And then Acrophobia. I rode that on my first visit. And while a lot of people like the ride, I'm not a huge fan of the system. I thought it was kind of painful to be in that kind of stand-up position for the drop tower. And the drop itself is good, but not among the best. But maybe I've just been spoiled with like Falcon's Fury per se. So that's going to be it for talking about the rides and the experience, but now I need to go into some things I think that could be improved at this park. So the ride collection I mentioned is one of the best. It's probably second or third of Six Flags parks that I've been to so far. But operations and layout are an issue. The park can be hard to get around, they don't run a lot of trains, and sometimes rides aren't able to open because they don't have enough staffing. These can take away from guest experience because ultimately, if you're going to a park for the rides, which I do, because the rides are most important for me. It's hard to really say how good the park is if you're unable to get on rides that are closed or running so slow that you aren't able to actually get on them because of the lines. So if anyone who represents Six Flies Over Georgia or works there is watching this video, you don't need new rides. Your lineup is great, and you have something that many want to see. But working on getting more staff and improving the operations overall and the loose article policy can go a long way because people will have more fun, they'll want to go back, and they'll get to enjoy your rides that you have put so much money into and made such a great lineup and park with. And that is my final statement. I think that's all that needs to be done to make over Georgia the truly great Six Flags Park. But for now, it's my fifth favorite. Hello everyone, it's Theme Park Avenue, I'm Eric, and recently I went to Six Flags Great Escape, or The Great Escape, and I must say, this will not be the most positive review. So, I'm going to talk about my poor experience here, as I think this is probably the worst Six Flags Park, and I'll give advice so you can have a better time here than I did. Before we begin this review, I encourage you to subscribe to Theme Park Avenue so you know when new coaster content comes out. I have other reviews, rankings, and other content on the way. Now I will point out, this might get pretty negative at points because I did not have a good time here, but I'll try to be fair, I'll go through my whole experience, analyze the best and worst things about the park, and give you some advice so you can have a good time here. Let's begin with the entrance experience. So we arrived on a Friday in June. 
and there was a large group of kids on a field trip. So, we thought we were smart going during school time, but clearly we were not. I'll tell you that right now. Try to plan so you do not go on a day with field trips because that can definitely be a pretty major dampener in your experience. So walking up, I do like the way they present the entrance. You have Steam and Demon and Adirondack Outlaw right at the front, and a sign reading Great Escape that's on the side of the Desperado Warehouse building, sort of, where they house part of the log flume. So that's good. Walking in, we get through security about 15, maybe 10 minutes before the park opening, and then we get through the entrance about two minutes before. Now, the big thing from the start was that they did not handle the entrance very well. It took the people in front of us a good three minutes to get into the park, and they already had tickets, so I was very surprised at that, and that was somewhat frustrating. So other members of my party in a different line were like, what took so long? So that was already an interesting start, but for the rides themselves, we walk over to Adirondack Outlaw first, thinking that's gonna be a line that does not die down. And I will say, that is probably where you want to go first. I will say, we did wait a good 15 minutes after opening to get on the ride because they didn't run. They had a few tests going, but they never opened the ride, even though we were near the very front of the line. So Adirondack Outlaw, we went there, and the ride itself is fantastic. The first cycle, it's quite thrilling. I never been on anything like it actually when I went, so that was interesting. And I like this kind of flat ride. I'd love to see more of them at other Six Flies parks even. It's intense, fun, very good. And you stay at the top for a very long time, I should let you know of that. You're sitting right set up. But you have to wait for the other car to load. And that is where you get beautiful views of the surrounding area. Mountains, great overlooks of the park. There's some rivers. It's very nice. And I'm going to point out one other thing. If you are a similar size to someone in your party, you will probably not be able to sit next to them due to some weight distribution things. Just kind of a side note. That said, this ride is great, and it is definitely one of the best rides at this park, and a very strong flat ride. So after this, we had the Seaman Demon. I will point out from the top of Adirondack Outlaw, we noticed that pretty much nothing was open. Seaman Demon was open, we rode that, and Coaster Studios had to call this a Seaman Pile of Trash. And I somewhat agree, but it wasn't quite as bad as you said. I thought the first drop and the loop were okay. They didn't have great forces, but they were not rough. The final course screws were quite bad, but before that, it is a passable roller coaster. So it is a bit worse than Corkscrew Cedar Point, but it is not the worst thing out there. And I'm not even sure if it's the worst roller coaster at Great Escape. I'll get to that later. Next, we go in the line for Canyon Blaster, the Aero Mine Train, sort of. And this, we saw it was a pretty long line, and when I saw just how slow the ride was moving, I was like, you know what, we'll come back to this later. So we head toward Alpine Bobsled and Comet. Alpine Bobsled was closed, and we found ourselves going to a dead end, and here's something I have to touch on. The layout in this park definitely was not prepared for the Six Flags kind of thing. It was just not easy to find my way around. At one point, I thought I was headed toward Comet, and I found myself in a dead end with just a bunch of lunch pavilions. So we ended up going backtracking pretty long time, and we get over to Comet because Alpine Bob's Slide is gone and closed and probably never gonna open again, but maybe it will. And Comet is fantastic. So our experience, my brother and I, we were in a car together. We start going, get to the lift hill, and we stop. So the ride broke down, not quite sure what it was, but they sent us through after that, and then we get off, then they send a few cars with no people, then they send people through again. So I did get two rides on Comet at this point, and then after that, the ride was down for the whole day. Very confusing, but I'll get to that later. And one thing I should point out, in summer in this area, there are tons of spongy moth caterpillars. We saw some of them all over the supports of Comet, all over the houses, all over the bathrooms, they're everywhere. So this is a common thing in the summer here. And these things are poisonous. Not terribly so. They can irritate your skin a bit. But I do want to warn, you will want to be ready to be very close to some of them, and they will legitimately fall out of the sky off of roller coaster cars and other things and end up on you. So if you are deathly afraid of that sort of thing, 
I would honestly recommend not going to this area at all, especially not in summer. But these things are essentially like cicada broods when you see those every few years. Only these happen every year from my understanding. So to talk about Comet, Comet is fantastic. You have great air time. The first drop is pretty strong. It has a bit of a rattle to it, but it's more of a classic wooden rattle than the painful one, so I actually enjoyed that rattle and thought I added to the coaster. It is a long ride, it is well paced, pretty well taken care of. It's probably among my favorite wooden coasters, so that's not very a high bar of praise because I've only been on El Toro and Ghost Rider and then Beast and pretty much nothing else that's great. This is possibly a top 5 wooden coaster for me. It's quite comparable to Apocalypse the Ride at Six Flags Magic Mountain, though I did like this a little better. So that is a very good ride, and many call that the best roller coaster in the park. I would agree. However, I do actually think Adirondack Outlaw is better, though maybe that's just because I really enjoy that view a lot from the top. So after this, we have no idea what to do. This is where things get very, very tough because of lines. So this is something I gotta touch on. This park has easily the worst operations in the chain, no doubt. You might think La Ronde, I'll get to that in my La Ronde review, but this is way worse. So, at this point, Flashback has probably hour long line, maybe longer than that. That's the boomerang, by the way. And then there are other things like Grease Lightning, the Super Loop, and there's very few things that have short lines. One thing we ended up doing, our family went on the train ride. I don't even remember the exact name. I think it was the Storytown train ride. That line was pretty short. I'd say we waited through one cycle, so it was a bit under 10 minutes. And this one is fascinating. So you go past some story structures they are based on fairy tales and such. You go past this jungle area, and you go past this old walking trail that used to be accessible through Timbertown, the kids' area. And I guess Timbertown was a fitting name for this trail because some trees have literally fallen onto it. So that's never opening again, I'm pretty sure. And unfortunately, there's this one elephant statue that you can see on the train ride where an ear's kind of falling off and part of the torso is like chunked out. So there are definitely a few things that could be done to make this look a little nicer, but that was not a huge deal. So this ride was fine. And they do have a very nice looking area in this park. I should probably talk about now the scenery. This park's atmosphere is quite nice. It's in a beautiful setting. I love the surrounding mountains and the forest that you're in do kind of make it feel quite immersive. You have a lot of small, somewhat charming little storybook houses, some old west area houses. There's this one kind of small creek over by the train ride with a sky ride going above it and some boats going in it and some of the more major rides to the right. And then to the left, you have Timbertown and such. The park looks nice. So walking around, you can enjoy a bit. But I will point out, despite being a heavily wooded park, the park does lack shade. So I did want to touch on that appearance a little bit because that's one of the strongest things about the park. So we get in line for flashback after a ride on Pandemonium, which is similar to the Cyborg ride at Six Flags New England. Fun flat ride, but not one I'm going to get into much. So flashback, I kid you not, we waited 45 minutes and a total of four trains had cycled through. I am not joking. That is the worst operations I've seen on any ride. And I will point out, line jumping is a pretty big thing. This might just be because we went on a day of field trips, but unfortunately, there was a lot, and I mean a lot of line jumping. Usually, I'll see it on most rides I go on in a Six Flags park, like pretty much any park. There will be five people or so at worst, there was legitimately probably 30 people who went in front at different times. Many of them were from school groups, some were not, and I think it was just kind of infuriating at certain points because the line was so long for that particular ride. So we did give up on flashback because it probably would have been another hour or two before we were able to get on. And we go over to Sasquatch. Sasquatch is the s, &S drop tower. They were running one tower, and here's a little minor nitpick. The Six Flags TV. Many of those in other parks have Looney Tunes clips and some top 10 things from Warner Bros stuff and trivia and plenty of fun stuff to keep you entertained. This one played the same loop that was a mashup of five songs, just a few seconds from each one, over and over again. And it was pretty loud, so you could definitely enjoy that very, very loud music for a very long time. That said, 
Sasquatch moved relatively fast, and it is a solid drop tower, even though it's among the weaker ones I've been on probably, but it is good. So after that, we head back toward Canyon Blaster. I should point out that broke down at least twice before we got on. We did get on it, and this is in serious contention for the worst roller coaster of the park. It's quite rough at points, but more importantly, it is just the most boring family coaster of all time. I know it's for families, so I should not be too harsh, but Aero Mine Trains are usually such fun rides. This one legitimately feels like you will valley at a certain point, because so little happens. And the roughness does not help, so it is among the weakest rides in the park. And I know Coaster Studio has already touched on the paint job thing. They have some beautiful paints, really well colored and stuff, on one part of the ride, but only that which can be easily seen from the main pathway. The rest of it is pretty old and faded, and I just don't kind of like that they did that. Then we rode Condor, that was our final ride. Cool to get on that, it was a fun little one. And the one other thing I'll touch on is the Kitty Coaster. At a certain point of the day, we had gotten on so little, and so much time had passed that I thought, you know what, I saw a Canopy Coaster said that this Kitty Coaster can be ridden without a child, and even though I did actually have a younger brother who did meet the requirements, we all went over thinking, we can at least get on this one ride that doesn't have a line. They ended up only letting him ride by himself, He's basically barely short enough to be in the requirement range, so I was a little confused by the rule, but he rode on his own and had fun. And we ended up getting on some stuff, but while some would go to a park to get on as many credits as possible and stuff, I left with a total of three. So that was not a huge number, but you know what? It's not a huge deal as I don't focus on credits that much at a park. And you know what? That ended up being the whole day. Condor is a fun ride and I'm going to go into some detail of the overall park. So first off, do keep in mind that the operations here just are not well done. I think most of the employees this was among their first days doing the whole thing, so maybe I just chose a bad time to go. You definitely want to try to go midweek in summer if you're able to. That's only a July thing, I'm pretty sure. But just try to avoid days of large crowds, and you will be able to have a fun time. That said, I did not have a great experience here because lines were really poorly managed, so I only got on a few rides. And I could mention that this is the weakest ride lineup of any Six Flags Park, but it's not a bad lineup. I like Comet, and I like Adirondack Outlaw, and some of the other flat rides are good, and there's some nice charming walking trails. The Alice in Wonderland one is pretty good, even though it is pretty simple. There is a nice storybook sort of family park charm to this one, and I can see why some like this. And I will point out, Canopy Coaster said this is a very nice park and charming, and he absolutely recommends it. Mike, you are a great reviewer, but I gotta say, either you got really lucky, I got really unlucky, or you were sugarcoating. Because I just felt that the operations held this park back more than any other. They seriously, compared to Six Flies Over Georgia, I would say Over Georgia's operations are fantastic. And that is quite, quite a low bar because I thought over George's operations were the worst I'd seen in any major theme park before that but unfortunately Great Escape while it does have some great rides and a nice atmosphere issues such as the poor management of rides and the long lines that happen even on semi crowded days because it was not the most crowded day it was not a great park and I think it's my least favorite Six Flags park and possibly my least favorite major theme park in America so if you go to this park, remember, try to hit up the rides that are near the front of the park that are easy to get to first. Comet is not a priority to get on because it runs so fast. Like, its line never got more than 10 minutes. So keep that in mind. And if you have any more questions about planning a trip to the Great Escape this summer, about whether it be crowds or caterpillars or something else, let me know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel for more content. I hope this did not come off as too negative, but I did not have a great time here. I'll see you next time. Hello everyone, it's Theme Park Avenue, I'm Eric. Six Flags America is one of the parks people believe is the worst in the chain. It has quite a bad reputation. However, based on my most recent visit, I'll be giving a full review and talking about why this park just might not be as bad as its reputation suggests.
before we begin this review, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you know new theme park content comes out. We do much more than park reviews here, we do tier lists, rankings of roller coasters, and tons of content both serious and funny. Now what I do in my park reviews typically, is I go through my entire experience there, I had a full day at this park, and along the way I will talk about individual things such as rides, and atmosphere, and operations, and so on. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get into the entry experience. So we immediately noticed that there aren't very few people at this park. This was possibly the least crowded Six Flags park we went to besides maybe Darien Lake. And I went to 14 this year, so that's definitely quite a bit to go off of. Now there were not many people in the dry park especially because the water park was open. This was a Sunday at the end of June, and everybody wanted to go to the water park instead of the theme park. So that meant there were not a whole lot of lines. We see Superman, Ride of Steel as we're walking through the entrance gate, and I must say one thing about the entrance plaza, it looks beautiful. You have that nice fountain in the middle, the buildings have a colonial style to them, it's small but it definitely looks very nice. And you might be thinking, wow this park looks great, but don't get used to that, I'll get to that a little later. So many were going to Ride of Steel first I'm sure, but the first ride my family went to was Raging Cajun, and here is one nugget of advice. Go to Raging Cajun first. It gets the longest line of the park by far, for a few reasons. The first is the lower capacity given the smaller amount of cars, another is the somewhat slow operations of this ride, and the final is the fact that it has a lower height requirement than other roller coasters, so it's open to a wider variety of people. Raging Cajun was the first ride we did, and we avoided half hour lines because of it. This ride is quite insane. I would argue it might be the scariest roller coaster in the park. The first half is your standard wild mouse coaster, not super fun getting slammed on the side, but the second half spins like crazy, and you even get crazy airtime at the end. And there is no word that better sells out this ride than insane, because it does really disorient you. And I would say, it's definitely a great family coaster to have at the park, even though it's probably a bit too intense for some members of the family. And it's definitely a strong ride to start the day, but the next ride we went to was Wild One and this ride opened probably 20 minutes after the park opened. I'm not sure why, given the fact that they ran many test trains and it was fine, but given that this ride is over 100 years old, I'm sure they have the reasons. Wild One is well over 100 years old now, and that's one of its best aspects. It has a very unique feel to it given how classic it is. There are plenty of classic wooden coasters out there, but few quite like this one. The ride is a bit rough given its age, However, it makes up for that with some great airtime moments, especially the double up, and the final intense helix. It is a long and fun ride, and it's a very good wooden coaster in the park. It's not one of the best rides in the park per se, but it's pretty high up there. And it's one that I don't think develops a super long line, so you don't have to worry too much about getting on this one. And next up we head toward the DC area. This DC area has a major flaw, and that is how it's sectioned off from the rest of the park. You walk a very thin path underneath Wild One to get to the DC stuff, and given that most of the best major rides are in this area, it's a little weird and confusing to find your way there the first time. So the first ride we do when we get into the DC area is Joker's Jinx. This premierized launch coaster is a spaghetti bowl model. It is a clone of Poltergeist, which is at Fiesta, Texas in San Antonio and also a clone of Flight of Fear at Kings Island and Kings Dominion. I think this might be my favorite of the spaghetti bowls, not by a huge margin, but it is very fun. The initial launch is not that special, but the layout is fantastic. The first half is slow disorienting inversions with great hang time, and the second half is taken incredibly fast. You don't have a ton of inversions, but it is super powerful, and the ending definitely pushes you into your seat. So it's overall a very strong Premier Rides launch coaster, not the best Premier Rides coaster out there, but definitely one of the best. And it's definitely a ride that doesn't get a huge line either, at least not compared to Raging Cajun. And the next ride we head toward is Superman Ride of Steel, the hyper coaster I was most excited for that day. And here's a good time as I need to talk about the operations here. This park's dispatches are some of the best. They load trains pretty quickly on the majority of roller coasters, and Superman especially was great. There was never more than a 2 minute wait pretty much, it was always a walk on on Superman Ride of Steel, 
and that was quite a surprise. One thing I will say, I think the good operations on this ride is probably the biggest difference between this and the Darien Lake equivalent of Ride of Steel. There are other differences, but let's talk about Superman Ride of Steel as a whole. This hypercoaster has a very strong first drop, some good airtime moments, an excellent sense of speed, helixes that don't provide a lot of forces but are very long and still cold to speed through them, and it takes you into the woods. There are flaws of this ride, unfortunately, that do kind of take back what makes the good parts good. The first is the restraints, which I think are more painful than those on Superman the Ride at Six Flags New England. That is just me, but I do think they are not very good restraints. Another thing that kind of stands out is the layout could really use some fine tuning. The straight sections feel way longer than the Darien Lake one for whatever reason, and you really just stay on them for a while without doing anything. While the ride holds its speed very well through the ride, its layout does not have the best of airtime, and as far as hypers go, it's one of the rougher ones. So I feel like with just a few tweaks to layout, it would have been a great hyper coaster, and I could overlook restraints and roughness more. But overall, while it is a great roller coaster, it's among the weaker hyper coasters I've done, and I would take any BNM hyper coaster over this one. Another thing that I need to point out is the fact that Ride of Steel at Darien Lake was the original. So I'm understanding that that one had a much better usage of terrain for that reason. This one goes through the forest, which is kind of cool when you're on the ride, but it means off the ride you can't see much of it. At Darien Lake, the ride goes over lakes, and that's a beautiful photo opportunity, and I like being able to see more of the hypercoaster layout. So after that we head toward Batwing, Batwing is closed, that is definitely the least reliable of the roller coasters at this park, and you are unlikely to get on it if you go here, just keep that in mind. The next ride we went on was Penguin Blizzard River, and this is a very unique ride, I'd never seen it before, but it's essentially a water slide in the dry park. You sit in what's kind of like a river rapids raft, but then you go down a slide, it really is a water slide. You have some nice colors on the off side of it, and I like the penguin statue, and you do get quite wet. My waterproof shorts were quite helpful. It's a very fun ride, even though it's not a standout in the park. And after that, we did Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth, the Sky Screamer. And this Sky Screamer is pretty good. I don't think it's the best. In fact, it's probably the worst Sky Screamer. It has a good sense of speed like the others, but unfortunately, it has the least impressive view of any Sky Screamer I've ever done. And another standout issue was the music they played. They were playing Dancing Queen by ABBA. I understand plenty of people like that song, I do not. And I have learned from Canopy Coaster that they play female empowerment songs because it's a Wonder Woman themed Skyscreamer. Now my question is, how is that a female empowerment song? Maybe I just don't understand what Dancing Queen's all about, but I like the New England one better because it plays Danger Zone, and Danger Zone is an awesome one to play when you're flying through the air at high speeds. So after these rides, we head over toward Batwing, which is now open. And you have a huge, flat, grassy patch in front of this ride, and here's where I need to point out the appearance of the park. This is one of the least visually impressive parks in the Six Flags chain. I like the entrance plaza, but the rest of it is not great. You just kind of have black top everywhere, and the rides are placed somewhat haphazardly in places that kind of mess with the park layout, and I just do not like the way this looks, unfortunately. I know it's kind of weird, but unfortunately, you got a random super loop in one area, Raging Cajun's kind of in the corner, the fact that Batwing is all the way in the back and there's nothing interesting to see on the walk to Batwing, basically. And none of the roller coasters stand out as looking all that great either, besides Firebird. The wooden coasters look okay, but Superman's not a great looking hyper because you can see so little of it. Joker's Jinx is alright, but the way they put some of the trees, you can't really see much of the layout. Batwing just has a really ugly plot of land that it's on. And I just don't know how I feel about the appearance of this park. Walking around, you will not be impressed the way you might be at some other parks in the chain, such as Discovery Kingdom or Fiesta Texas. That's a kind of minor nitpick, but it does take away from the overall experience of the park. 
Now back to Batwing. Batwing was my favorite ride in the park. It is a Vekoma Flying Dutchman, and a very intense ride. The worst part is the lift hill because you are facing up toward the sun. Just close your eyes during that part. But the ride itself has an intense vertical loop, an awesome helix that brings you frighteningly close to the ground, great final inversions, and a long fun ride experience that even though it isn't quite up there with the B&M flying coasters, is a great ride overall. I think Batwing is definitely a must in the park if you can get on it, and it is my favorite roller coaster at the park, and I'm happy I was able to get multiple rides on it. Now I should talk about Harley Quinn Spin Sanity. This is the giant pendulum ride, also known as a Zamperla Giga Discovery, and I think these are very fun rides. This is one of my favorite non-roller coaster rides in the park, possibly the favorite, as it is just very fast and gives you good airtime. There are this kind of ride at basically every Six Flies park, and I enjoy this one quite a bit. So that's it for the DC area rides. Next we rode Firebird, and I was not prepared for how bad Firebird was going to be. It is one of the worst B&M roller coasters by far. It doesn't have a very good layout, and I know it's the first one so I can kind of excuse that a little, but the roughness is really intolerable, and the floorless trains do not help at all. I almost wonder if it was better as a stand-up, and I only give the ride credit for its good color scheme. Other than that, I just don't like anything about the ride really, and I would recommend skipping it unless you are extremely tolerant of roughness and want the credit. Roar was closed the day we went, so I did not ride that. We rode bumper cars because we were basically done with everything we wanted to after two hours in the park because of how few lines there were. And there are some other rides we did that I should point out. I'll point out Mind Erasers or SLC. It's not the worst SLC, but I do not enjoy these rides, and many other enthusiasts do not, so if you have been on other ones, there's really no point in riding this one. Voodoo Drop is their Intamin Drop Tower, and I was shocked at how powerful this one was. The drop gives great airtime and it's very intense, and it's actually among my favorite drop towers despite its pretty small size. They also have a nice train ride that gives very good views of the park, though it does not operate very often. And that's all the rides we did. And overall thoughts on this park, I think it is a good place to go to if you're in the area or you're just trying to go to a lot of parks and do a lot of roller coasters. The big things that stand out as needing work are appearance, and I understand they are doing some work with that, but this park is definitely better than some have said because its operations are not bad. It has very good operations, a top 4 roller coaster collection that's quite strong, and plenty of good flat rides. I think the park definitely has a bit of a bad rap due to things from a little while ago, but now the park has definitely changed, and it's worth going to if you're nearby. And overall, it's a good park, if you can get on Batwing especially, and I just think it's definitely worth visiting, but not one that you need to travel out of your way to, because even though it's among the weaker Six Flags parks, it's a very fun time. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, comment down below your thoughts on Six Flags America, and any other park reviews you'd like to see. Subscribe for more theme park content, I'll see you next time. Hello everyone, it's Theme Park Avenue, I'm Eric. Recently, I went to Six Flies Discovery Kingdom, so today, I'm going to talk about the whole experience, and talk about why it might be the most underrated Six Flies park. Before we get into the review, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you know when new content comes out. Now to kind of tell you what's going to happen here, I'm going to go through my entire experience in the park, I had one day here, and I will go into some individual aspects of the park along the way, things like operations and rides and such. I'll draw some comparisons maybe to other parks, maybe to what other people have said about the park in the past. I'll also give you some helpful tips that you can use when you go to this park. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the review. My visit to this park began driving up from a very nearby hotel. And the park looks very nice from the road, 
Most of the roller coasters are up front and center in the park, so you can see all of them, and it's pretty cool. Most of the roller coasters do look nice. And then, when you are driving up to the entrance, we got there right around opening time, maybe five minutes before. And I will say, you definitely want to be at the park around opening time, because the first hour, hour and a half is when lines are short. This is the case for most parks, but definitely that's when you'll be able to get a lot of rides in. We got on four roller coasters in the first 90 minutes, so there's not a whole lot else that we were able to do afterwards, meaning we had most of the stuff we needed to do out of the way early on. So we drive over to the parking lot, and across from the parking lot is where the park is, and it's separated by a lake of some sort. So it's a pretty long walk to get from the parking lot to the park going past the lake. It's a very pretty lake and I like the views you get, but it is going to be a 10 or 15 minute walk. And maybe you'll think you can run and you can get there really fast, but there's always a lot of people walking on this path. So unfortunately, it's unlikely you'll be able to get there faster than 10 minutes. So once we're at the park right around opening time, we realize it's a slightly more than crowded day because we did go on a weekend since this was March and there aren't any weekday openings. We first look at the layout and Cedar Flags actually made the point that this park has a very poor layout since you walk by all of the DC roller coasters to get to the front entrance. And then you have to walk around a Sea Lion Stadium and back to basically where you were to get to those coasters. I can see why this would be frustrating, but it's a very small park and it's not a super long walk from the entrance of the coasters, so it didn't bother me too much. Now another thing I do really have to make note of is the fact that some roller coasters will probably be closed on your visit. Vertical Velocity, the kind of Wicked Twister impulse thing but very different, it was closed and is closed for the season. That's unfortunate, so I didn't get on that. And Joker, despite running the whole morning, was unfortunately not opening. It was just testing the whole morning. But I will say one thing I like about the DC area, on the way there you will walk by penguins. I like penguins a lot, so that's a good start. Now for some individual roller coaster reviews. Our first ride of the day was Superman Ultimate Flight. A very short line because many people were waiting out in Joker like people do for Steel Vengeance at opening time. And Superman Ultimate Flight was awesome. I think this is one of the best premierized roller coasters. The launches were powerful. The tunnel added a lot, actually. The hang time was good. The restraints were comfortable. And overall, I just thought it was a fantastic ride. Some of the theming in the queue is nice. And there wasn't really anything I disliked. I actually liked this a lot more than West Coast Racers, which I rode the day before. The next ride we went to was Batman. This is the SNS 40 Freespin. And I've been on a few of these, one at New England, one at Over Texas, one at Great Adventure. And New England one is my favorite, as it was not painful, but I thought the Over Texas one was a bit painful. This one might be the best of them all, I thought. I got two different rides on it, and I'll say right now, the flipping sensations are very, very intense, and definitely different from most of the other free spins in my experience. The two rides I got were similar but had their differences, hence why it's a free spin, and I enjoyed the ride a lot. It's definitely a pretty underrated one, and overall this seemed like a really good start. So before walking over to other roller coasters because Joker's down and B2 is down, we went to this Sea Lion show that was going on for pass holders, which we were. And we stayed for a little bit, just a couple minutes, and we thought it was fine. I'm not a huge fan of animal shows, personally. I'm not against them happening that much, but watching animals perform isn't my favorite thing to do. I love animals, but not necessarily in that environment. But it was an educational show, so that was fine. We walk across the main entrance plaza, and I'll point out there's a very nice dolphin statue. And as a matter of fact, the appearance of this park is great. It's probably the nicest looking Six Flags park I've been to so far. There's a lot of foliage and plants, not a ton of them provide shade, but they all look nice and kind of fit the environments that the animals are in. Mainly in the front half things look good, 
all the roller coasters are aesthetically pleasing, and even though they're close together, I don't think they look cluttered. And the atmosphere is nice. The dolphin statue is good, and I think overall there's a lot of cool colorful animal statues. And the animals here and there look very cool and nice to see. And I just enjoy the way the park looks. So we went to Medusa afterwards. And Medusa is awesome. It was my favorite roller coaster in the park at the point of riding it. And it's my favorite B&M Floorless now. I thought the first drop was incredibly strong. Every inversion pulls great forces. It was not rough. I lightly tapped my head against the headrest a couple times, but it never hurt. I thought it was just a fantastic ride. Paced incredibly well. And it kind of shows how the 90s roller coasters that focus on inversions, inversion, inversions can be just as good as today's modern roller coasters with crazy unique elements. It's a classic, but it's really good. And definitely a fantastic roller coaster. The next ride we went to was Kong. I know some of you will immediately think I went on Kong just for the credit, but I also wanted to give it a chance. I hadn't been on an SLC in about 5 years, so maybe they were much better than I remember. Let's start with the operations of this ride. Before this, the operations were actually pretty strong, despite what I'd heard from many. Superman was dispatching pretty quickly, Batman was decent, Medusa was doing a really good job, but Kong was not doing too well. It runs one train, I believe, always, and literally every time the car would pull in, people would get out, the next people would get in, be individually strapped in by the employees, then the restraints would be open again for no reason that I know of, and then they would shut them all again. So each dispatch took anywhere from three to five minutes. The employees tried to keep us entertained in the queue, joking about how relaxing and smooth the ride was. And I'm serious, even the employees hate this ride, I guess. And we got on after four cars went before us, but it was a half hour of waiting because of how long it took. The ride itself was better than expected. I thought the strange... I'm gonna call it a wave turn, I know it's not, but it's just the turn after the pretzel looking inversion. And the double twist at the end were pretty intense and fairly smooth elements. The rest of it was really janky and I did not enjoy it. A bad ride, but not terrible per se. So that's all for Kong. Now we went to the back half of the park. And this is something a lot of people hate. I know Coaster Dash made a point of the back half being dreadful. But I have a few things to say about it that might not be what you think about the back half. First thing I'll talk about is Boomerang Coast to Coaster. That one's operations were possibly worse than Kong's. In the loading station, there was never any guests except for the people in the car. They would always keep the people outside a loading station in the sunny area instead of letting the people in as the car is going so they're able to immediately walk through the gate. I thought this was weird, and at one point we waited 10 minutes in between the people getting off the car and the next group getting on. I never found out why, but that was weird. The ride itself was not good. A slight improvement over Kong as the loop was pretty good, and it was less bumpy, but it was still pretty bumpy. Next we walked over by the Sidewinder Safari construction, and this was honestly surprising. I thought the entire coaster was intact because it was supposed to be a 2020 opening coaster if I'm not mistaken. But there's like two pieces of track in. Most of them are lying around. And I know it would only take a month or two really to get all that in if they were to work hard and such and consistently. It's probably going to be a midsummer opening though. And I thought the whole ride was going to be intact. So then we walked by the River Rapids which was closed the day we went. And one thing I kind of want to point out, maybe it's just my inner creativity kicking in, but I really thought they would have live animals along the ride. I know you can't have tigers right there, and maybe they would have to fence off the animals, but I thought it'd be cool if you went by live animals on a water ride like that. So after this, we walked over to the animal exhibits in the back half. And I enjoy this a lot. I enjoy zoos. I think they're cool. And I like seeing the giraffes here, lions, tigers, wolves, so many different animals, quite a variety. And you're right along the lake, which is very nice as well. 
And this is all cool. And then we went to the butterfly garden. Something I did not know existed at the park. But this was awesome, honestly. I know it sounds weird for me to praise a butterfly garden, but they had a whole environment set up with many plants and an artificial waterfall, many butterflies and a lot of educational areas, and it honestly felt like something you would see at a really strong zoo. Something like the National Zoo in DC, even. So I enjoyed that a lot. We did the shark encounter afterwards, and it's similar to SeaWorlds, the biggest difference being the conveyor belt that you walk along was not working. But other than that, it was a cool exhibit. We also noticed there was this train track that went across the front of the shark encounter walk. And I thought that was weird because I couldn't find the entrance for the train. And I wanted to know more about what that was. But moving forward, we walked past the sea lion exhibit. Where there's also just some sea lions swimming around, not the show. Which was nice. Hammerhead, one of the flat rides, was closed. And the only thing I'm going to mention about the food now was because there was some free mini corn dogs that were given to pass holders on the day we went for some reason. They were decent. I didn't think they were going to be as good as they were, and they were fine food. Not anything to write home about, but definitely not bad tasting. And next we went to Joker, which was finally running conveniently as we got to that area, and we're like, yay, we're gonna get on. We were next to get on after two cars total went before us, and the ride closed again. I was shocked. I talked to an employee and they said the ride was running too fast and according to California state law it was not allowed to run as fast as it was. So they had to de-lubricate the track or something like that. I don't fully understand the mechanics behind it but they were doing something like that. And there was this booklet of one time flash passes the employee at the ride had and he gave my brother and I three each. Really awesome of him. But I will say the fact that they had these booklets of mini flash passes tells me these Joker issues happen a lot. So overall, that was a cool experience to get those. We used them on an extra ride on each of the favorite coasters of the park, Medusa, Batman the Ride, and Superman Ultimate Flight. Each ride was even better than the first one. We also rode Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth, which is a really good pendulum ride. It's not the tallest, but the sensations are awesome. And now we're leaving the park, sad that Joker is a lost cause and we're not getting on. We walk in front of the kind of log flume ride, and by the way, with Joker's lift hill behind it, it's a really nice view. And we see Joker testing. And I'm maybe delusional at this point, but I run back to get on Joker. It's not open yet, but about 15-20 minutes later, it opened up. Everyone else in the park had given up at this point. So we went in, got on, I rode Joker. And Joker was definitely the best coaster in the park, and it is awesome. It's honestly a really underrated RMC. I hear many say it's the worst, but it absolutely destroys Twisted Cyclone in my opinion. The airtime is really strong, the inversions are some of the best on any RMC, it's smooth as any RMC would be, the pacing is great, it feels like a really long ride. The only things that I kind of have to hold against it are it does have the weakest drop of any RMC. That's mostly due to its size. And also due to its size, the fact that it's not the fastest feeling RMC. But it's paced really well, it feels long, and it's just an excellent ride overall. So that is the entire experience. My overall thoughts? It's a really good park. There are some issues, some of the operation things are unfortunately very frustrating. They can be found at many other Six Flags Park similar operation issues, but it is unfortunate. Also the depth of the roller coaster lineup and ride lineup as a whole isn't super strong, but most of the stuff they have is definitely underrated. And of course the layout can be frustrating and confusing, but I don't think it's a huge deal. And I just enjoyed this park for its nice atmosphere, animal exhibits, and great roller coasters. It's definitely a good park overall. I definitely like it more than Six Flags New England, mainly because Six Flags New England only has like three passable rides in my opinion. And though close, I do prefer it to Six Flags over Georgia. I know many will disagree with that, but over Georgia's layout is way worse than this one. And even though the ride lineup is stronger over Georgia, I enjoyed my time at Discovery Kingdom more. The animal things were just really fun, 
and something special in the Six Flags Park for me. And this is definitely a good park, and I definitely recommend coming here. But make sure you're wary of the operation issues and you get there for the first hour or two, as that's when you're going to have the best experience. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. It's really the first in-depth review we've done in a while. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. And so you can get more coaster content soon. I'll see you next time.